Okay, so 3.6.1 and 3.6.2 were basically introductions to the concept of Dirac notation and how to use it. Uh, 3.6.3 is going to be talking about why we even want to use Dirac notation. And the simple answer is that it sort of, uh, it, it's a faster, uh, more simple way to, or it offers a faster and more simple way to convert from one basis to another. So previously, when we were still talking with you know algebraic notation and uh, matrices and whatnot, uh, if we wanted to convert between position space and momentum space, for example, uh, to do so, you sort of had to do this very long, complicated proof to get into a Fourier transform, and then from there, do the actual Fourier transform integral. Now, uh, Dirac notation, it seems kind of redundant learning it now because we already know the proof that we, we could use to like sort of show that a Fourier transform lets us convert between, for example, uh, psi of x comma t and phi of p comma t, right? Seems kind of redundant because we already know that we can convert between one and the other via Fourier transforms, but the actual, to like prove that you can do it, using algebraic notation is a lot more complicated compared to in Dirac notation. And generally in Dirac notation, it's just simpler and neater to write out changes of basis um, and we'll see that more and more as we go forward. But for now, um, let's just try to prove that the actual proof for getting to the Fourier transform integral itself is significantly more simple in Dirac notation. And to do that, we're going to be using the projection vector or the projection operator. So we already know what the projection operator is from the previous section. We also found out from the previous section that if you summed up all the individual projection operators for a given orthonormal basis, you will get the identity, uh, the identity matrix, either that or one, depending on if you're working in terms of matrices or if you're working in terms of just algebraic notation, right? Uh, this is something we already proved in the previous part in 3.6.2. So if you're not sure why this is the case, uh, just go back there and look at the example from 3.6.2. But generally, this is true. So assuming that you know, we're working in physics right, and in quantum mechanics, the, the, the three sort of fundamental values we're always working with is position, momentum, and energy. Uh, I'm going to write out three forms of this in terms of x, p, and n, where n is the energy eigenstates. And I'm going to say that in all three cases, uh, the summation or the integral sum, because for position and momentum, it's continuous, right, of all the uh, orthonormal basises are going to sum to equal one. So one is equal to the integral dx projection x for position space. One is equal to the integral dp projection p for momentum space. And then one is equal to the summation of projection n for energy space, right? So at this point, if these are in fact equal to one, what we can do now is we can say, okay, if these are true, then in that case, uh, we can act on them with the general state vector and we can get an equivalent expression, right? If I multiply both sides of this equation with the general state vector S of T, right? In that case, I'm gonna get three different representations of the state vector, one in position space, one in momentum space, one in energy space. What I mean by that is if I start with the first one, right? This is gonna give me that this is equal to dx projection x, but this time the latter, the bra at the end of it becomes an inner product of x with s of t. This is just the wave function in position space, right? So this is gonna equal integral psi x comma t vector x dx, right? And if you're curious about why the dx appears at the front of the integral here and appears at the back end here, this is purely a notational choice. Um, I know that some people tend to like to write the dx at the front of the integral when you're dealing with uh, a case where you're integrating something that's not a variable but a function. Because remember, this is a projection operator, right? It's a function of x, it's not just x, right? So in order to distinguish between something like this, you sort of, uh, some people tend to choose to put the dx at the front of the integral instead of at the back to sort of give you a heads up of like, hey, you know, this expression contains functions of the variable of integration. It's not just the variable itself, but either way, it, it's entirely notational. Um, you can do it or you can not, it doesn't really matter. So don't be scared if you see this in Griffiths specifically, he does this. Uh, moving on for momentum, 
you have the state vector is equal to integral dp, similarly ket p bra p with s of t, in which case uh, this term in here becomes the momentum space wave function, so integral phi p comma t, and then ket p dp. Finally, uh, for energy, this is going to be summation n n inner product of s of t, and this is going to give me the coefficients of energy, right, for the probability of being in a given discrete energy eigenstate. So this is going to be summation c n of t, and then these individual vectors n. And now let's actually see how we can solve a conversion of basis problem, and we'll do that in example 3.9. Okay, so in example 3.9, our goal is to convert from momentum space into position space and relate the two. Uh, and we are obviously going to be doing it via sort of the properties we've derived here. So uh, if we want to express psi in terms of phi, let's start off by writing out phi. So we know that phi of p comma t can be written in terms of the state vector as the inner product of momentum with the state vector itself like this, right? And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to replace the state vector one of these three choices. So I have three options. I'm obviously not going to use the bottommost one because that's an energy one and I don't care about energy. I'm trying to convert between momentum and position. If I use the momentum one, this is going to give me a trivial expression because this is going to be p inner product with p itself. It's just going to relate the phi wave function to phi itself, which is just going to give me like one equals to one or zero equals to zero or something like that. So my only option left is to use the x version. So if I plug in the x version, this is going to give me an inner product of momentum with this integral dx and then the projection vector of x inner product with the state vector. This is immediately going to go to psi of x comma t, right? So what I'm going to left with is p and then integral dx x psi x comma t. And then if I move the integral all the way out to the left and include the p, right, this is going to give me an integral of the inner product of p with x, and then psi of x comma t. So at this point, um, this term right here is actually something we solved way back then. Uh, back in section 3.3.2, I believe. So this is from section 3.3.2, example uh, 3.2. And this is where we're dealing with the continuous spectrum. Uh, and we were asked to find the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of the momentum operator in x space. So we were asked to find p hat in x space in this example. And what we found was that the inner product of x with p, so the opposite of this one right here. So we found that the inner product of x with p was actually equal to one over root two pi h bar e to the positive i p x over h bar. And if you don't remember how to get this, go back to this section, look at this example. Um, so what that means is that, well, this term, inner product of p, with x, this is just equal to the complex conjugate of x with p, right? You can reverse the order of the inner product by taking a complex conjugate. This is therefore equal to one over root two pi h bar e to the negative i p x over h bar. So if I then plug that in, then what I get is that phi is equal to the integral of one over root two pi h bar. Um, e to the negative i p x over h bar times big psi x comma t dx. And this is just the standard Fourier transform equation. So we've done sort of, uh, we've done a proof and showed that we can convert between phi and psi via a Fourier transform uh, in this very sort of short, quick and sweet sort of uh, proof. 
where we take advantage of this S of T being defined in terms of the projection operator. Uh, whereas in contrast, when we were working with you know, algebraic expressions, I believe the proof was significantly longer and more difficult to understand. So uh, that sort of shows you that you know, uh, if the proof is easier, that sort of implies that actually doing basis conversions in Dirac Delta might actually also be significantly easier and more simple when we actually get to those problems down the line. Uh, and that is this example. So now let's move on to the final example of the section, and then we'll be done with this chapter. Okay, example 3.10, we are asked to find the position operator in P space by starting out with an X space wave function. So before we even start this example, um, Griffiths is going to make a claim right away, and he's gonna say, you can actually sandwich an operator between the basis that you want to work in and the state function and that'll actually give you that operator in that basis. So what we mean by that is that if I sandwich uh, the x hat operator between position state and the actual state vector like this, this is going to give me x psi x comma t because x hat becomes x in position space, right? The x hat operator goes to x in position space or not the P space, it's uh, X space. Now in contrast, if I wanted to find the position operator in momentum space, for example, I could sandwich it between P and S of T. And what that'll give me is it'll give me the momentum space version of position, which in this case is I H bar D by DP with phi of P comma T. So X hat goes to I H bar d by dp in p space. And if you think about it, this is kind of, uh, this is pretty similar to the idea of like sandwiching uh, a vector or an operator or whatever it may be between a, the, the column and row vectors uh, of a given matrix to find the individual elements of that matrix that we, this is something we did like I think back at the start of the chapter, right? If you want to know like a, i, j of like a given uh, matrix, you can plug in like uh, column I and then a hat uh, row J or like row I column J, I forget what the order is. This is sort of an analogous um, operation. Uh, so he doesn't really give a proof for this. He's just saying, this is true. Um, use this to show that you can actually find that x hat in p space is equal to this, right? So we're gonna we're gonna prove what he claims here by deduction, and we're gonna do that by writing out the proof and showing that if I actually try to solve this, I'm going to get something that looks like this, and it's actually it's going to indicate therefore that the momentum that the momentum space version of the position operator is going to turn out to be i h bar p by dp, right? So uh, let's start by just writing it out. So inner product of P, X hat sandwich in the middle, S comma T. I'm gonna rewrite my state vector. So I wanna write my state vector in X space because if I write it in P space, this entire thing is gonna become a trivial thing. So I'm trying to find X hat acting on the X space uh, state in P space, right? So this is gonna give me P and then X hat integral dx and then my projection of x onto the state vector immediately this thing is obviously going to become psi of x comma t right so this is going to equal p x hat i'm going to move the integral all the way to the left um, x psi x comma t dx like that and at this point I have a sandwiched X operator in between a P and X, right? So I know what P, the inner product of P and X is because I solved it or I didn't solve it, but I refer referenced the, the problem where I solved it up here, right? Section 3.3.2, example 3.2. Um, but I have this X hat that's sort of in the middle and it's clogging things up. So I'm not sure what to do about it. Um, and the way that you resolve this is you consider the eigenvalue equation. Because you know that you know x hat operating on x is gonna give you x x hat. Or sorry, 
x hat operating on vector x is going to give you x times that same vector x. That is just the standard eigenvalue expression, right? This is your eigenfunction. And this is your eigenvalue. Now, if you remember way back when we first introduced the concept of the eigenvalue equation, we were talking about how that corresponds to, you know, x hat and p hat. What we said was that the eigenvalue equation for x specifically in position space is a little bit unique. And the reason for that is because traditionally the eigenvalue is considered a constant, right? This thing is a constant. It's a number. It's a number, it can be like one, two, three, four, whatever it is, it's a number. And we denote it with X as a variable, but in reality, this thing, this is a number, not a variable, not variable X. And because of the fact that it's treated as just a constant number and not a variable, that implies that in this inner product, it can move out to the left without interfering with any functions or formulas. Because once again, it's not a variable in the context of this operation, right? So what that means is you can actually move this x out and treat it like it's a constant, leaving you with an inner product of p with x. Now that being said, you can't move this x out of the integral entirely because it's only a constant with reference to the function of the inner product of p and x it is still being summed along with all the other versions of x along every orthonormal basis of x. So in terms of the integral, it's still being summed as a variable, but in relation to this inner product itself, it is considered a constant. So because of that, you can move it out of this inner product. You cannot move it out of the integral. Now with that, I can rewrite the inner product of p and x as I did before. This is going to give me the inner integral of x e to the negative i p x over h bar over the square root of 2 pi h bar uh, psi of x comma t dx and at this point uh, I'm pretty close because remember this is originally p x hat st in this sort of sandwiched uh, inner product right my goal is to show that this somehow wants to, has to equal, uh, what was it? I h bar d by dp of phi, right? So this is somehow supposed to equal I h bar d by dp of phi. So this right here is already phi, right? Because this is just the Fourier transform that we solved in the earlier expression over here, right? So. I have to somehow turn this x into an i h bar d by dp. Well, fortunately, uh, we have an exponential expression here. And when we have an exponential expression, we can sort of turn that into derivatives of itself without that much issue, right? So if I convert this, if I, if I convert this to i h bar d by dp of the integral of e to the negative i p x over h bar square root 2 pi h bar psi of x comma t this is this works out right because the derivative of this function right here right is going to just be like d by dp of e to the negative i p x over h bar is going to equal negative i x over h bar e to the negative i p x over h bar so what i have to do now is i just add an i at the top to cancel act the negative and make it a positive and then add an h bar at the top to cancel out with the h bar at the bottom. And just like that, I've sort of like, I've massaged it into the form I want. This thing becomes phi, right? So this is just equal to i h bar partial with respect to p times phi of p comma t. And with that, we're done with this example and we're done with chapter three. Uh, we can now move on to the problems and then after that, finally go to chapter four.